Good evening. I'm Siwa Bili Rose Amador LeBeau, and today we're going to welcome Dr. Deborah Miranda, and she's an enrolled member of the Ohlone Costanoan Esalen Nation of California. She's also of Shumash and Jewish ancestry, and Deborah is an associate professor of English at Washington and Lee University in Virginia. She's authored several books, the most recent, Fat Indians, a Tribal Memoir. Welcome, Deborah. It's so nice to have you here all the way from Virginia. Thank you. Thank is you our weather a little bit better than yours? Um, yes. Our, we were 10 degrees this morning. So. Oh, so I shouldn't complain about <laughs> the, rain, the rain. I'll huh? <laughs> Definitely. So you've written several books, and this is what you're, about your third? This is my third one. It's the only one that's mixed genre and not just poetry. Okay, and you told me that you wanted to be an author, but what? Well, ever since I was a little girl, I was writing stories. And when I got a little older and more towards college age, people told me, well, you can't be a writer. <laughs> Indians aren't writers, and you won't make any money. So I became a special ed teacher and put writing aside for quite a few years. And then eventually it caught back up with me. Oh, good. And I had to keep writing. And I went back to school when my kids were in middle school and got a Ph.D. in English at the University of Washington. Well, good for you, and congratulations. And I'm Thank glad you. they told you that because you got a Ph.D. <laughs> <laughs> and you wrote books, right? Yes, yes. All Sometimes right. the timing has to be right. So Bad Indians, where did you come up with that name? I did a lot of research uh, about California Indians, and you'd be surprised how many thousands of times that phrase, bad Indians, I'm comes up <laughs> in the old archives, mm -hmm. in the mission records, in newspaper articles. So-and-so was a bad Indian. He did this horrible thing. Uh, so you could either be a good Indian or a bad Indian. And my dad at one point said to me, you know, even when we were dead, we were never good enough. Because, you know, the saying was, the only good Indian is a oh, dead Indian. True. And he said, mm -hmm. even when we're dead, we're not good <laughs> enough. And so why not be bad? <laughs> and so the combination of, of those things made me realize that bad Indians are what got me here. You know, my ancestors who were bad and who broke the rules and refused to give in and refused to die off, mm -hmm. they're the reason I'm here. So I should be praising them. That's true, and that's pretty much the case with a lot of California Indians, and that's yeah. why they're not enrolled or recognized, because they refuse to mm -hmm. submit to the government requirements for all of the above. Right. Um, and it goes all the way back to when we were in school, because I remember even having to do those projects, and the way they would read or tell us the history it was you're sitting there sinking because oh. yeah you were a bad Indian yes, <laughs> right exactly there was no such thing as a good Indian so mm -hmm. you must be bad and I noticed on the cover of your book you are sitting on a horse and you have a cowboy hat on you and you're like a little cowgirl mm -hmm. I'm right? about four years old and I think it was taken in Los Angeles probably right before my mom moved us out of Los Angeles to Washington State. Mm -hmm. And there used to be photographers who would come around and set you up on a pony, dress you up, take your picture, and then, you know, charge your parents five bucks or something. So I, I like that picture. My publisher, Heyday, liked that picture because it was sort of the anti-Indian mm -hmm. stereotype. I have a good friend who's a great comedian. He's Danae Mark Yaffe. He's been on the show and he said he didn't learn he was Navajo until he was in his 20s. And um, he says, you know, all this time I realized I was suiting up for the wrong team, you know? <laughs> and that's what the picture reminded me of, yep. you know? You're yeah. suiting up for the wrong team. You want to assimilate. You want to mm -hmm. be, mm -hmm. you know, the, the dominant culture. So as a result of that, um, there's the fourth grade project in California that we're all required to write projects on the missions. Now, I remember going to the missions and my dad saying, that's where they buried all the Indians and those mass graves and they were built by the Indians and they killed them by making the buildings, <laughs> you know. I remember him telling us those stories. So you wrote about that. Right. That's not the story that most kids get about California missions. And fourth grade in the United States is when American kids learn about Indians, basically. That's the fourth grade unit anywhere. In Washington State it was Lewis and Clark and the Oregon Trail and here in California it's the mission unit. Um, I moved out of, out of California before I had a chance 
to do a mission unit. So you did one. So I did one. That's what this book Let's is. Let's hear about it's it. It's my very late fourth grade mission. I'd like to hear some of it. Okay. One of the things kids often do for their fourth grade project is make a glossary. So I did a glossary, and one of the entries in my glossary is bells. Bells, from the start, the hollow stones with voices. Made in their own land, hard beyond rock or bone or abalone shell, shaped by hands of unseen beings we thought must be gods. Soldiers brought them from the ships, hung them first from trees, then on wooden frames. At last, the bell sounded from the campanario in the church itself, after we made it, after we built the church. The voice of the bell is the voice of the padres. We try, but we cannot always obey. Bells at dawn, keening, bells ordering us to pray, the alcalde standing over us with cudgels and long canes, invoking silence. Bells direct us to breakfast, gruel of atole quickly swallowed. Bells tell us to scatter to our work, we women to laundry and looms, grinding corn or acorns or wheat, the gardens harvesting, storing, preparing, cooking, men to the fields to plow, plant, slaughter cattle, adobe, plaster, tile, paint our designs inside the church. Men work their leather, repair soldiers' saddles, plate reins, or the cords of whips they use on us. Seamstresses cut, stitch, clothe our naked shame. Blacksmith practice the art of heated metal, metal, beating until the acceptable shape emerges. Vaqueros herd and skin the cattle for the hides the Spaniards love so, swimming in blood day after day till Indian skins smell like death too. Bells for midday meal, atole again. Bells return us to our labors, tell us to demand prayers or instruction in prayer. Bells determine the evening meal, maybe pozole with meat. Bells give us permission to sleep. Once the bells hung silent. The padres told us to put all else aside, join in gathering a great tide of sardines. Oh, what pleasure while we brought in that slippery harvest. For days we waited in the surf with our baskets, salty water bathing us of dust and blood, sun claiming our bare backs. We sang lusty songs out beyond the Padre's hearing. I heard laughter all around me as the young unmarried men and women, separated in day by work and at night by lock and key, exchanged more than looks. Some of us caught as much as ten barrels, but when the barrels ran out and still the sardines came, we showed the padres how to open the sardines, remove the spines, put them to dry in the sun. This they gave away to anyone who asked. This would never have happened, we thought, if the bells still spoke. On holy day we left the sardines in peace, went hunting for nests of water birds that live in the rocks. We passed that day camping on the beach, small groups of us, each with its fire, roasting and eating what we had caught. Friends rested together, gossiping. Daughters, normally sequestered in the Monherio, leaned against their mothers contentedly. Children ate their fill, slept on the warm sand with bones still tight in their fists. Our souls swam gratefully into dream, whole and unbroken. The padres stood to one side, watched, laughed to see us at such ease. Next day we woke to bells. The voice of the bell is the voice of the Padre. We tried, but we cannot always obey. Wow, pretty powerful. I took the, that story from a letter that Padre Serra wrote to some of his fellow priests about daily life at the mission. So that, that story really did happen. They, he really was describing how the bells defined the day. It was almost like a military kind of mm -hmm. regime. And then one day, this huge wave of sardines came in, and everything had to stop while the Indians gathered them. So that's that's a real story. And but it's you're seeing it from the Indian perspective instead of from the Spanish perspective. And this is a story that should be told in the in history classes. Right. You know, so yeah. the kids learn the real history. Yeah, that it know? was not um, something fun to be mm -hmm. an Indian in a mission. I think it probably a better example would be it was like being a slave in a southern plantation. What kind of reaction do you get from your readers? 99.9% .9 of the reactions have been really positive. Mm -hmm. um, other California Indians saying, yes, this is the story that hasn't been told. 
um, and non-California Indians who are still Native people saying, wow, <laughs> I never knew you guys had it this bad. Um, you know, we just sort of, I actually heard somebody say, I thought all you California Indians were dead. So sometimes they don't even know they where they exist. They tried Yeah, yeah, no kidding. It wasn't through lack of effort. Right, that's true. Now, your family is very involved. I know your sister is chairwoman of the Esla Nation. Yes. Is that correct? Louise. Louise, she's a good friend of mine. And there's been a lot of efforts to restore the language and so forth. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Well, a, quite a while ago, I heard about a program at Berkeley called Breath of Life. And I kept urging Louise to sign up for it. And after a while, she finally did. It was kind of one of those things where if you say it long enough, you know, she will. So she went for um, one year, and I got a phone call from her in the middle of the conference. And she was just ecstatic. She was saying, I can't believe this. We can learn our language. I know these words almost before I learn them. I'm writing a prayer. Wow. I'm understanding it. We can connect with our ancestors. And she was just walking on cloud nine. So she went another time by herself. And then finally, I think the third time I went with her. And so I was able to get a taste of for a week of living with a lot of other California Indians mm -hmm. working to wake up their sleeping languages and um, it was it was a really special special time they bring in linguists mm -hmm. and assistants and show you how to use the materials at the Bancroft library um, you get to listen to old wax cylinder recordings wow. handle old ethno ethnographic notes um, it's really really a beautiful thing I know she, I've seen a lot of the displays she has had at the different powwows mm -hmm and they're normally educational displays, which are so important because um, there's so many youth kids that go to the powwows and for them to actually see and touch and feel. Mm -hmm. She does a lot of the jewelry making right? Um, and has the kids, you know, make the jewelry, she teaches them. So it's just so powerful to, to reconnect. And you said a lot of your, that's what a lot of your stories are, reconnecting. Right, the, trying to put these little pieces that we found not back to the original piece, but into a new kind of mosaic that mm -hmm. we can claim as our identity. Um, something strong enough to withstand everything we've been through. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you have another piece to read for us? I do. I would love to read this piece um, that's something I wrote at the Breath of Life conference. It's my form of baby Eslin. It's called Teheyapami Achiska, which means giving honor or giving praise. That's for my sister Louise and the Breath of Life language conference. Ani micha elpa mishmakanano, I feel you in my blood. Nishiano, nishitin kanano, nishahorno, in my bones, my gut, my teeth. Name sikosura niche akhi, you rise all around. Kolo pisik hudin opa, return like a lover. Nishku niche lahake, my basket, carry me. Nishimilia, Nietzsche, Lesapka, my ocean, bathe me. Eni name humu nipsha, I am your hummingbird. Name hi iyatan neku masianech, you are a flower of the heart. Name cha'a nish ka ha sakhano, I feel you in my head. Nish kushuno, nish kaneno, my hands, my feet. Ukharat kai pire, we dance on the cliff of the world. Name cha a nish cha wa sekano, I feel you in my spine. Nish horoxno, nish sekano, my throat, my womb. Name sa na kakopa, eni inam kakopa, you are a river, I am the rain. Mantuhite, 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 it is true, it is true, it is true. It is true. Nish welel lech welel. My language, our language. Maxiri maknoko, breath of life. Oh, that's beautiful. I had a lot of help writing that. Did you? That's beautiful. <laughs> from uh, Ruth, our assistant, and from my sister Louise. Wow. Now, this is your third book. Where can someone get this book? Heyday Books, which is based in Berkeley, and their website is just heydaybooks.com. So you can order directly from them. You can also get it on Amazon.com. Mm, okay. And you can find it at Barnes & Noble. 
They're one of the stores that carry it. And quite a few independent bookstores in uh, the Bay Area are carrying it now. Well, that's excellent. I hope they get it in all the schools, too. Well, it probably won't go into the grade schools. There are some things in there that you don't necessarily want to <laughs> okay. speak to fourth graders about, some realities. Um, high school, college? High school and college. It's definitely, it's already been picked up by numerous university courses. Oh, good. Excellent. Across the country. Now, mm -hmm. you've written two other books. Can you tell me about those? Yes. My first book of poetry was called Indian Cartography, and it won the Diane DeCora uh, First Book Award from the Native Writers Circle of oh, America. Congratulations. And I, I just entered a contest and won that, so it was a pretty wow. big moment, a big surprise. And the second one is called The Zen of La Llorona, and it's also poetry, and that's from Salt Press. Mm. It was uh, my second collection, so, you know, better than the first <laughs> in wow, some ways. Wow, congratulations. That's <laughs> amazing. You. And uh, we need, well, you're going to be making this, the rounds out in this area in California, right. I'm Northern on sabbatical. California. Yep, I'm on sabbatical this whole school year. Okay. So I've had a clump of time in January. Then I'll be back for a few more weeks in April. Um, I'll be back for the LA Times Book Festival and doing readings around the area during that month of April. Mm, that's excellent. Um, could I put you on the spot and ask you to read us another piece? I would like to read this Wonderful. piece for my dad. Okay. Yeah. My dad was one of the main reasons I took up this project. Um, like a lot of California Indians, trying to understand what happened to our parents and our grandparents helps us understand ourselves. This is called One for the Road. It's for my father, Alfred Edward Miranda, November 19, 1927 to June 27, 2009. I need a song. I need a song like a river cool and dark and wet, like a battered old oak, gnarled bark, bitter acorns. A song like a dragonfly, shimmer, hover, swerve, like embers too hot to touch. I need a song like your scarred calloused hands, a song with the echo of solstice, a seed's hard and shiny promise. I need a song like ashes, like abalone, tough as stone, smooth as a ripple at the edge of the bay. I need a song with a heart wrapped in barbed wire, a song with a good set of lungs. I need a song with guts. I need a song like lightning, just one blaze of insight, a song hurtling from hurricane's mouth, a snake charming song, a busting up song, a shut up and listen to the creator song. I need a song that rears its head up like Mount Diablo, beacon for the dispossessed. I need a song small enough to fit in my pocket, big enough to wrap around the wide shoulders of my grief. A song with chords raw as cheap rum and a rhythm that beats like magma. I need a song that forgives me. I need a song that forgives my lack of forgiveness. I need a song so terrible that the first note splinters like slate, spits shards out into the universe. Yes, that's the song I need, the right song to accompany your first steps along the Milky Way. Song with serrated edges, burnt red rim slicing into the Pacific. The song you taught me, Daddy, howling notes that hit the ghost road hard, never look back. Wow, that's a powerful one. Is your father still with us? No, he passed away a few years ago. I'm sure he enjoyed that. You know, he never he never liked me writing about him. Really? And somebody once said the the best revenge for a daughter is to be a writer. <laughs> 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 the worst thing that can happen to a father. Um, but I really do feel like you know he had a story to tell that he couldn't. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling parts of it. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And again, where can someone get the book? Heydaybooks.com or um, Amazon. Amazon. And the book is Bad Indians. You should pick it up because we have to support our Native writers. Um, we don't have many of them. It's, you know, it's been a tough road to hoe. Um, when I was growing up in the 1970s, there were, I could not find any Native writers. And that was one of the reasons I gave up writing. I didn't have any role models. A couple days ago, I was at UC Santa Cruz talking to the students there, mm -hmm. and several Native writers came up to me and said, you know, what do you do in creative writing when they tell you to stop writing political stuff about being Indian? 
And I said, don't stop writing it. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard that. You know, it's that. like, if you're Indian, you can't really be anything but political. Um, that doesn't mean it can't also be beautiful poetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm really happy if I can be a model for some kids. And I'm, you are a role model. You are a role model. You're a role model being a professor. How, hey. And how long have you been teaching now? I've been teaching for about... 14 years, and actually I just found out that the English department voted unanimously to promote me to full professor. Wow, well congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. For our doctor. <laughs> Good for you, that's wonderful. So how do you like teaching? I love it, Yeah, I love it. I never get tired of introducing students to American ethnic literature mm -hmm. and teaching them critical ways of looking at the world and expressing themselves. So. Do you find that um, the reception is different on the West Coast versus uh, East Coast? Yes, yeah. I would I would say so. Um, I am often the only Native person my my East Coast students have ever met. Really? Yeah. So for a long time they didn't know what to make of me, <laughs> and uh, one of one of the student evaluations said, "She's a Native American feminist," you know, and and he didn't mean it in a nice way. Uh -huh. <laughs> But it actually um, has worked to my favor because, you know, I sort of attract students who want that alternative perspective. Uh -huh. And so you're going to be going to colleges mainly in the area here? Well, colleges, bookstores. Um, I'm visiting genealogical societies and historical societies. Basically any place that is interested in California history. That's great. And you mentioned about some of the pictures that, that you have in your book, and we won't be showing the pictures, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about why you picked what you, right. what you selected for the book. Well, some of them are family photos uh -huh. um, that go with stories. Um, some of them are pictures of Indians that have great stories to go with them, like Jacinta Gonzalez, who um, worked in Monterey at the restaurant where Robert Louis Stevenson um, stayed when he was visiting in Monterey and before he had written Treasure Island or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde he lived in Monterey and got really sick and Jacinta Gonzalez was an Esalen woman who was called to heal him. Uh -huh. So you know there's this I found a picture of her that's uh -huh. just amazing so um, some of them are historical photographs some of them are pictures of newspaper documents um, such as where the title comes from um, Bad Indian Goes on Rampage at Santa Inez was a Los Angeles Times headline in 1909 um, with an accompanying story about a Miranda family who <laughs> came barreling out of the house, each one with a gun. Oh, so, boy. <laughs> yeah, so lots of documents, um, ethnographic notes, mission mm -hmm. records, um, even a BIA blood quantum chart. Oh, that was interesting, too. You tell, <laughs> tell me about that story. Well, my mom, when I was 13, wanted to see if I might be eligible to apply for some college scholarships. Mm -hmm. So she wrote to the BIA, this was before she had gotten back together with my dad, and asked them, you know, how do I find this out? And they sent her a copy of this elaborate graph that you had to figure out how many tenths of Indian the mother was and how many tenths of Indian the father was and kind of draw this graph together and... Uh, it just was so complicated. See where you end up in the middle, huh? Yeah, and somewhere in there, somewhere in that <laughs> graph like is these, me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Out, yeah. There, and so I was sitting around with those one day, and I thought I can think of something better to do with these charts. <laughs> so I had a good time. I had a good uh, time with that's that. That's great. Well, I want to congratulate you on all the work you've done. You've done an excellent job. You're a great role model for oh, all of us, you. and especially for our youth coming up, that they have someone to look forward to. To that's a writer, that's a doctor, you know, educator, and it's wonderful. And, you know, that you're bringing with your family the language back and so, mm -hmm. so involved, because I know your sister's so involved. Absolutely. Um, in everything mm -hmm. <laughs> in the community. I know, I know. So that's really wonderful. So, again, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to Native Voice TV. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it a lot. And uh, the audience out there, I want to thank you for watching Native Voice TV for all these years. You know, we're going on nine years now. It's, can you believe that? But we are on Facebook. So if you look for Facebook, you'll see pictures from today's shooting. You'll see pictures that we've taken, different events that we've gone to in the community. See Patsing David Romero's our photographer. So he's out there just uh, putting everything <laughs> Uh, in our memory books there. And actually, that's one thing that we want to do this year is have a pictorial book mm -hmm. of all the different events and p community members. And 
people yeah. who have been involved who, you know, every, they're, they're, they're there all the mm -hmm. time. We count on them, but let's recognize them. Absolutely. Let's put them in the yeah. history book so someone else could look at That's them later right. on and see who they were, what they did. Because some of the people that we've even had on the show are gone. Yeah. You know, so yeah. at least we could have some kind of uh, something that we can leave t for our kids, leave for the, the libraries, mm -hmm. leave for the schools to have a, a record yeah, I think of what our community was involved that's in. That's a lesson we've learned, right? If we don't document it, nobody will. That's right, and we have to document it correctly. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. Good night. Indigenous soul.